Hey there, I'm Ken. This is Canadian Retro Things. Welcome. I am going to give it one more shot today trying to fix that completely vexing Commodore 64 that I have. I am of course talking about that Commodore 64 that I thought was working and then I discovered it didn't work with the disk drive. Well, I thought easy fix. I changed out U2, started working with the disk drive, but then I tried the diagnostic test on it and it was freezing up during the screen RAM test. And it was showing U9, U11, and U21 is bad. So I tried to figure out what was going on wrong there and I changed out every single chip in it, test or tested, socketed, changed, and or tested. Um, I found a few kind of bad RAM chips. They were just right on the edge. They were failing some of the time. So I replaced them. And I am no closer to figuring out what is wrong with it. So I figured I will give it one more chance. If I cannot figure it out now, I'm going to have to send it on to somebody smarter than me to try to figure out what is going on with this board because it is starting to haunt my nightmares. But before we get working on that board, I have to give a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, PCB Way. PCB Way, where you can get PCBs printed starting at only $5 for 10 boards. If you're doing a big repair on a piece of retro electronics like the Commodore 64 I'm working on, then you probably need a lot of different tools. PCB Way can not only help you with your PCBs you need printed, they can also help you with the tools you need. Just visit the module store and then you can find things like precision screwdrivers, mini hot plates, oscilloscopes, soldering tools, and many, many other things. So visit PCB Way today at www.pcbway.com. So far on this board, I've removed every chip, socketed them, and tested or replaced each of them. I talked to Frank over at Retro Rewind and he had the same suggestion that I was thinking. The original socket that was on the board Perhaps the VIC chip socket is flaky, as it's an original cheap single white socket that Commodore used. So the first thing I'm going to do is the easiest and the quickest, and that is to reflow the solder on the original socket and see if that helps. Then I'll try the diagnostic cartridge and see what happens. Newsflash, it did not help. I tried the diagnostic cartridge and got the same result. It froze during the screen RAM test three out of the five times that I tried running it. And every time showed the U9, U11, and U22 as bad. So that means it's time to change the socket. But I did discover something going through old footage. I had thought for some reason the VIC chip was the only socketed chip on the board, but I was wrong. As you can see from this old footage, the board had three other original sockets. They were U8, U13, and U25. So. It's time to pull out the soldering iron again and get to work on replacing those original sockets. Even if they're not bad, they're not very good, so I do believe that they are one thing that should be replaced if you're comfortable working on one of these boards. Is it going to work here? I hope so, but there's no guarantee, so fingers crossed. Well, that didn't do anything. I'm not going to bore you with constantly showing you the same result of the diagnostic program freezing on the screen RAM over and over again. If something changes, I'll show you that. 
My next thought is that it was when working around the VIC chip that the most progress was made, meaning of course it was then that the diagnostic program started being able to run through its process entirely, at least some of the time. So I'm going to focus on this area right now, starting with the two capacitors that are here. Now I have checked over all of the capacitors and none appear to have any problems. There's no bulging or leaking, and there's currently zero power problems. But I'll see if, like some of the RAM chips, some of the capacitors are right on the edge. So I just removed the capacitor from right here. That's this one right here. And when we test it, we can see that it's at 11.31 microfarads and the ESR is 5.4. That's a little bit high for the ESR and a little bit above the 10% for the uh, cap. So this one's just a little bit out of spec. So maybe this just being a little tiny bit out of spec might be what... Uh, was uh, the problem. So I am going to replace it with another one that I know is good and let's see from there if that might be a problem, might have been a problem, if that makes any improvement whatsoever. However if one is slightly out of spec that means that other ones might be too. Again, that changed nothing. So before I leave this area, it's time to go back to the previous video's comments. One of the things that was suggested that may be wrong with the board that's causing this little glitch that's happening is the timing. So the clock crystal. So we're gonna test what the output is on U19 pin 17, which should be about 1.02, we are 1.03 megahertz. So that is proper. So let's see if that clock signal is going up to U7 pin 1. There we go, 1.03 megahertz as well. So no clock loss there. So it is not the timing crystal. So I've gone through the board. I've pulled about three quarters of the capacitors off and checked them. So far I have found nothing. Nothing looks like it's going to be bad, but I'm going to continue checking. The other thing I guess, um, running down what we've done so far. The chips are good. The sockets are all good, making good contact. It is not the uh, clock circuit. Uh, power is fine. And um, looks like so far, most of the capacitors have been fine. So once I'm done checking all the capacitors, I guess I will move on to just starting to check like resistors and everything else because there's got to be something on this board that is doing this. I just have no idea what it is. One thing about it, soon I am going to have just about a completely new Commodore 64 here. And it will hopefully, if it ever gets running, be a great test board with all of the chips socketed. All right, well, let's uh, finish checking up the uh, capacitors and then move on to checking resistors and everything else. I have been going over this board and I found a couple of things that piqued my interest that I thought was a little unusual. The first one being right here, C12. C12 is supposed to have a 0.1 microfarad capacitor in it. 
and it looks like it's got a 10 microfarad capacitor in it, electrolytic, when it's supposed to be a ceramic. So I will change that. I don't know if that's going to make a difference. I think it's just a bleed off circuit, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Now that brings me to uh, the resistors that I tested. Now I can already hear the keyboards clicking and people saying, no, 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 testing the resistors in the circuit is a bad idea because other components will affect it. True, but it did narrow it down to a few resistors that either are not giving the right uh, reading or are being affected by other things. So rather than taking every single resistor off the board, this narrows it down to five resistors. The first and most interesting being R31. It's got a 1K uh, resistor in it right now. According to the book, it's supposed to have a 180 ohm resistor in it. However, I'm not getting either of those readings on this uh, resistor. And I did look it up online, a little bit of an argument there, but most people are saying that their boards do have the 1K resistor in there. So we'll take that out and test it because it is a 1K resistor by the colors on it. And then we've got R51 over here, which should be a 1.5K and it's not no, showing anywhere near that. Then we've got R2 up here, which should be a 1.5K that's not showing anywhere near that. And then we've got R29 and R30 right here and here. Now these two, I'm gonna guess maybe are in Sear, or they're being affected by each other anyway. So they should both be uh, 1K resistors, but, oh wait, that's R29 and R30, there and there. So um, they're showing bad numbers as well. So I am going to remove each, well first I'll change this capacitor over, then I'm gonna take each of those resistors out and test them and put brand new ones in their place. I don't know if that's going to affect it. I mean, there's something on this board that is only very slightly affecting everything. So we'll see if this helps. Just a quick note. I decided to keep C12 the same as what it is on the board. After reading some of the online discussions, it turns out that the early runs of this board had the electrolytic cap and the later ones had the ceramic one. So as not to upset things, I'm keeping it as is. Okay, this is very strange. I removed the resistors and checked them. All of them were just fine. I did, however, replace them with new ones since I had them out. I then went and tested the computer with the diagnostic cartridge and it is no longer freezing up. It is glitching on the screen RAM test some of the time, but it is constantly running through the entire diagnostic without freezing. So progress has finally been made. However, I have no explanation why this happened just after pulling and replacing a few resistors that were good. Since the diagnostic cart is going through the process on a regular basis, I'm going to hook up the entire harness again, which is the perfect time to talk about the excellent products from Retro Rewind, where you can pick up your own diagnostic cartridge and diagnostic harness. And you can even get 10% off by using my discount code CRT10. Just go to www.retrorewind.ca and check out everything you need for your Commodores and Tandy computers. All right, so shall we turn this on and see what happens with the full diagnostic cartridge on it?
This is even stranger. With the diagnostic harness hooked up, it's passing everything and not showing any bad chips. I guess I'll let this run for a bit and see what happens. Okay, after it's been running for a while, I've discovered that once about every five cycles, the screen RAM test is glitching. Once that happens, it's showing U9, U11, and U22 as bad again. It's glitching, but it's not freezing. So, so I think now is probably a good time to test out some of those games that weren't properly working before. And now it's time to see what happens with games since it seems to be mostly working. All right, well, let's go with uh, BC's Quest for Tires over on the Easy Flash cartridge. Now I will put up the actual game footage compared to what it was doing before just to see if there's any differences. All right, well, it's varying the uh, distance between objects. It's bringing me different objects. Oh, is it repeat? Nope. It's going into this. Uh-huh. So, tree, tree. Oh, good. Log. Is varying the distance between objects. It's varying the types of objects, so it's not repeating like it was before. This looks good. So I have added a keyboard to the mix. Now I will try Gorf. And what it was doing before was halfway between a level, it was resetting. Apparently my Gorf's playing skills have uh, mostly disappeared. So. It looks to be Gorf is working just fine. It's not resetting in the middle of the levels like it did before. So I tried Chase HQ and the same glitch happened again. This got me thinking though. So I decided to try it on my 100% working machine, which is what you're looking at right now. As you can see, the screen does what I had described before and what I thought was a glitch. I'm now thinking this is actually just part of the game. Oh, I guess that's my mistake. Chase HQ was not glitching. Okay, I've added a keyboard, so let's write a quick little program just to have it running and see what happens. And just for fun, let's make it black.
Well, that seems to be running just fine. Well, I am going to just let it run for a little while and see what happens. So this program has just passed the um, 18 minute mark and it has been running without a problem. So I'd say this is a pass. To further test the computer, I decided to load a game from disk. So I chose what you see here. It is one of the gold box Advanced Dungeons and Dragons games, Pool of Radiance. I intended to play this game for about 15 minutes just to test it out. That 15 minutes quickly turned into about seven hours. And that was seven or so hours of playing this game without a single glitch or problem. And this is a very large game. It comes on eight discs. So there was a lot of disc swapping going on and loading things up. So it was well tested. And as I said, there were no problems whatsoever. And for the sake of completeness, I am now going to try and load a game from cassette. I'm going to be doing Hunchback. Because I know that works if you've watched my video where I use my other Commodore to load up a bunch of games. And Shift, run, stop, press play on tape. Found Hunchback. Excellent. So let's see if this completely loads or not. And here we are. We're into Hunchback. So let's see if it works. Everything's looking good here. And jump. Jump. Oh, didn't jump. Yeah, looks like this is working. So I'll play this for a bit and, uh... Ah. I seem to have forgotten how to play this game. Alright, I played this game a few times through and... Um, yeah. It seems to be working just fine. Our little game repetition problem is fixed and the diagnostic cart is passing most of the time. So I guess I'll have to call this computer 98% fixed. I really don't know what's going on. I don't even know why it started working all of a sudden because it was after the resistors, after I pulled them out and put new ones in, but I tested all those resistors. They're working fine. So I don't really know what could have happened there. I mean, my best guess is that somewhere on the board, there is a flaky trace that is causing the problem. And when I was heating up the solder pads for taking the resistors um, out, it probably made a better connection on wherever that little flaky piece is, which I don't have any clue where that is. I've gone over the board as closely as I can with a magnifier and I can't see anything wrong. So I'm baffled. I'm completely and utterly baffled on why this thing is working now, but it is. And the only reason that I can think of that it's working is that I just threw as much as I could at the wall to see what would stick. and something stuck while my back was turned and I don't know what it was. All right, well, I guess this is kind of a success. So I hope you enjoyed this video. 
If you did, don't forget that a like, a subscribe, and a comment below are all things that help the channel out a lot and are greatly appreciated. Until next time, see you later.